Amen. So we're back in the book of Matthew. Uh, it's been a while since we've been uh, in this book. We had a little bit of a break there, but uh, it's good to get back. We're kind of rounding out the book. And of course, Matthew 26 is a rather long chapter, if you hadn't noticed that already. Um, I'll try to get through I'm going to try to get through this whole thing tonight. So, you know, there's a lot of things, as you know, you could say probably about any chapter in the Word of God. There's so many things that we could just park it on and focus on and, and really and, and really dive into and get some great truths. But, you know, we are trying to go verse by verse through these. And, and, and so I'm just going to kind of touch on a few things tonight. And, uh, you know, really one of the things I want to start out touching on is, is, is Judas. And we see a couple things about Judas uh, when we start out here. The traits of a Judas, of course, Judas was the betrayer. He was the one that, uh, you know, as we just read, um, turned uh, Christ over and betrayed him, uh, turned him over to the, to the authorities and, and betrayed him. And there's some characteristics that we can look at in this chapter and learn about, uh, uh, about Judas. Because the thing is, you know, there are still Judases today. We, we, uh, you know, we, we sometimes, I think, uh, forget that. Sometimes we forget that there are people who have a lot of the same motives as a Judas and that have some of the same tactics as a Judas. And uh, that's something I want to talk about. And then maybe towards the end we'll just look at Peter a little bit because I think there's some things that we can relate to. I think Peter is one of the more relatable characters in Scripture. You know, oftentimes we find ourselves maybe uh, reading about Peter and think, boy, that really reminds me of somebody I know. You know, who's <laughs> doing all these, these, right. these foolish things. But there's a lot of good things about Peter, of course, as well that we, uh, we see in the Gospels. But get, getting it right into it there where it says in verse 1, and it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people into a palace of the high priest, who was called uh, Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take uh, Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? Now, in ver there in verse 8, it's interesting to note, and if you would, turn over to John chapter 12. Keep something, of course, in Matthew. But go over to John chapter 12. When you get to John 12, keep something in John. We're going to be right around that area of John tonight a few times. But I want to point out there in Matthew, in verse 8, it says, When his disciples saw it, they had indignation. So it wasn't just Judas. We read elsewhere, as we'll see here in a minute, in John, that it was one of his disciples that really had the, the, the uproar here, that he was really uh, upset him. But it does say here in Matthew that they had indignation, right. doesn't it? So it's plural, meaning it wasn't just Judas that had this indignation, saying, to what, uh, to what purpose is this waste? And really, that's one of the first traits I want to point out about a Jews, Judas, is that a Judas affects those around him. You know, Judas will, will his, uh, he'll affect the other people that are surrounded by him. And they won't often know a Judas is somebody who can creep in and, and, and play the part. And people will just think he's another one of the guys. He's just another church member. He's just another what have you. And what they don't realize is that his presence, his being there, he's slowly affecting them. And if you look there in John chapter 12, look at verse 4. Because make no doubt about it, it was Judas that ultimately had the, the, the greatest indignation. He was responsible for this attitude among his disciples. It says in John chapter 12, verse 4, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So who was the source ultimately of this great indignation that they all had? It was John, or not, excuse me, it wasn't John, but it was Judas Iscariot. Okay. So again, one of the first things that we see about a Judas is that a Judas, his, he, he spreads his doctrine, he spreads his attitude, uh, his covetousness, he spreads these things just like Jesus describes it as, as sin it does in, uh, as, as leaven in bread. And that's how we see it uh, in, oftentimes in churches. People creep in and they begin to preach uh, things privately. You know, they only tell their close friends. And they allow them to start to tell their close friends. And the next thing you know, some strange or, or, or obscure doctrine has crept its way into the church and has to be dealt with. And it's the same way uh, here with Judas. You know, his doctrine, his covetousness in this case, is what began to spread, I believe, in the hearts of the disciples around him. He, he was upset. They saw perhaps how upset he was, his great indignation. He pipes up and says, you know, why are you, uh, why, why, are you uh, why is this not being given to the poor? Why is this waste being made? They all want to, they all want to sound... As spiritual as Judas. Oh yeah, yeah. Why aren't you giving us the poor? Why are you just why are, why are you just pouring this out? Hmm. And really, when is it that they speak up? 
You know, I mean, Judas, Judas, Judas only speaks up after he has swayed the hearts of others. And that's really why we have to guard our hearts and, and, and be vigilant uh, against these type of things. Because I believe that's how, and Judas didn't just come right out of the gate. I believe he kind of waited for this opportunity. He saw, perhaps, that he had uh, these other guys would be with him, that they would take his side, as it were. And that's when he begins to come out with his, uh, what, what's truly in his heart becomes to come, up and come out. Because, of course, we all know that the scripture, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, a Judas really what else we so see here is that a Judas he masks his true intentions that's what he does he masks his true intentions and how does he mask those true intentions what he does is he masks, masks them behind good intentions his true intentions are masked behind uh, what would seem like good intentions he tries to hide it behind a veil of you know hyper spirituality he tries to hide it behind a veil of, of right motives but really what it, what is it that he that he uh, uh, is coveting. What is it really motivating uh, Judas to say such a thing? Well, look there in John 12, verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor. So the scripture is telling us he wasn't making this objection because he really had a heart for the poor people. That's not why he spoke up, but that is the way he wanted to come across. It's sounding very spiritual, it's sounding as one who had such a heart for the poor that he would even object to this anointing of Christ. But because he was a thief, that's that's what he really was. Right. That's why he said what he said. But what do we see him doing? Trying to mask that behind a veil of what seemed like good intentions. And had the bag and bear what was put therein. So we see that Judas is, you know, they speak up after they have swayed the hearts of others. They are greedy. They're self-centered people. He didn't care for the poor. He cared only about the fact that there was money being wasted. Right. And he was a covetous individual. And he speaks up after he knows the other guys are with him. And he can kind of hide what he really is behind his uh, mask of spirituality. And he had effect on others. And really, uh, the lesson that we could take from this is that's why it's so important to get Judas's out. That's why Judas should not be uh, tolerated inside a church. When somebody is found to have uh, certain traits or characteristics or are found in certain sins, the Bible is very clear that they need to be cast out. And not just the sins that we are all capable of in 1 Corinthians 5. But also, I'll read to you from Romans chapter 16. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. The Bible is very clear that when if somebody were to bring in, and I'm not saying every little thing, that if you have a, 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 you know, a slight interpretation that's, that's a little different, or you believe, you, you disagree with some point that the pastor preaches, that you're automatically to be marked and avoided. But when you're bringing in a damnable heresy, when you're bringing in something that goes against you know, uh, just what's traditionally been believed and understood from the Scriptures, plain as day, and, you're, and you persist in preaching that blasphemy, right. the Bible is very clear that you are here to be marked, and you're to be avoided, uh, and and, and that, that's what, and we can see why it's so important to do that because of the fact that a Judas it, it spreads like eleven his doctrine, his covetousness, whatever you may have, it spreads to those around him. Now, if you would, look, we'll continue on here. We'll come back a little bit later. I don't want to try and hit all the Judas points right away, but we'll we'll come back and look at some of the other traits as we move along. But if we pick it back up here in verse nine, it says, "For this oil that might have been sold for much and given to the poor." When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me uh, ye have not always. For in that he saith, uh, for in that she hath poured this ointment on my head, on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there also this that this woman hath done. Uh, be told for a memorial of her. And it, it, has that not come true? Yeah. Right. I mean, is she not? written and, 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 and inscribed in the immortal words uh, uh -huh. in the scriptures. Uh -huh. You know, everyone reads about this woman. In fact, the Bible, we'll see here in a minute, tells us exactly who this woman was. But what's interesting here is that Jesus plainly tells his disciples of his coming death. If you look there in verse 2, it says, And you know that, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. I mean, that's not a real mysterious, that's not a dark saying. I mean, right. well, crucified. I wonder what he meant by that. Right. He's going to be betrayed. Mm -hmm. I wonder what he meant by that. He's being very plain. He's being very direct. He's being very uh, forthcoming about what's going to take place. But yet, and he's done that in multiple occasions. We read that about the elsewhere in Scripture. He was very uh, straightforward about the fact that he was going to be betrayed and crucified. But they always, the disciples, they never quite grasped that, did they? We read about that in the Scriptures. They failed to understand this, though Jesus made it clear on multiple occasions. And you know, what's interesting is, is who did understand this? It was this woman. 
this woman that uh, took that precious ointment and break it uh, and poured it upon his head for his burial, she, I believe, understood what right. she was doing. Right. She knew that she was anointing him. We read elsewhere where she actually uh, you know, fell at his feet and wiped uh, his feet uh, with her tears. And it's interesting uh, who it is exactly. If you would, um, if, you know, look there in John chapter 12, uh, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Jesus, uh, where, where Lazarus, excuse me, uh, was, which had been dead, and, uh, whom he raised from the dead, verse 2. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, spikener, a pound of ointment of spikener, very costly, and anoint the feet of Jesus and wipe his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So it tells us right there, in fact, who this woman was. This was Mary. And, you know, Mary understood what was going on. She, I believe, understood that Christ was about to be crucified. I mean, she's weeping at his feet, she's anointing his body. But she grasped something that Jesus had made very clear to his other disciples and said, look, I'm going to be crucified. And they, they still couldn't grasp it. Yet Mary understood. Why is that? Why is it that this woman, Mary, understood and, her, and the disciples did not? If you would, keep something again in John, but go over to Luke chapter 10. I believe we'll see why. In Luke chapter 10, I'll begin reading in verse 38. Luke 10, 38, it says, Now it came to pass as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was covered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful about many and many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now that is that same Mary, the sister of Martha. The same woman who poured the ointment right. on her head. The same woman who understood what the disciples could not grasp. That simple truth that Christ was going to be crucified. And why is that? Well, I believe this that passage shows us. Because she took the time to sit at Jesus' feet. There were some things, you know, and what we can apply here is that there's some things that we can only learn by getting along with God. Oh. I mean, we can listen to all the preaching we want online. We can show up to all three services. And, you know, but sometimes we just have to get along with God. And, and, and pray to Him and ask Him to open the eyes of our understanding. Amen. Amen. Help Him to give us a discerning spirit. Help Him to teach us things by His Spirit in the Word of God. I believe that's why she understood this so much clearer than anybody else, because she had taken the time. Not to say that she was lazy. I'm sure she did her fair amount of serving, you know, her fair amount of sacrifice. Did she not sacrifice the ointment? Right. But she also took the time prior to this to sit down at Jesus' feet and hear His words and really listen to what He had to say. And I believe that's why she was given a little bit more understanding of, of what Jesus meant and why she was able to understand some things that even his own closest disciples could not understand. So the whole point of that is that, again, there are some things we will only learn when we get along with God. Now, if you would, go back to Matthew. We'll move along here in, in uh, verse 14. Again, we're trying to get through 75 verses tonight. So you can see right there how that one great truth could become a whole great sermon yeah, right there. You know? yeah. Maybe one of you guys want to write that sermon. I don't know <laughs> if I don't read it to you first. But anyway, <clears throat> look there in verse 14 where it says, the, Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver you uh, him unto you. And they covenanted him with, for thirty pieces of silver, and from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So, I mean, Judas just, I mean, what a wicked man. He gets yeah. so upset about this that he goes out and he, and he betrays Christ for 30 pieces of silver. You know, and, and, and Judas, he's waiting for the op opportune time, right? And that's another trait of, again, of a Judas is somebody who bides their time. They wait for the opportunity to present itself before they spring their trap. They're very subtle. They're very crafty. They know what they're doing. And, you know, if you take that uh, person who has that uh, discernment, that subtlety, that, that uh, uh, I don't want to say wisdom necessarily, but the wherewithal to know when and where to strike, and you couple that with their feigned spirituality, they become very hard to detect. They become very hard to detect. And, in fact, you know, uh, <clears throat> the following verses here in Matthew show us uh, that Judas was able to hide amongst the twelve, I mean, throughout the, the entire ministry of Christ. He was able to conceal himself. Uh, it says there in verse 17, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go to the city to such a man, and say to him, The Master saith, My time uh, is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. 
Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, verily uh, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began to say one of them, uh, and began and every one of them to say unto him, It's Judas, isn't it? It's Judas, right, Lord? I knew it the whole time. No, they're suspecting themselves. Right. I mean, it, it, you'd think Judas would just be so obvious, you know, but he isn't. That's how subtle and crafty these these wow. Judases are. They can get you thinking that maybe it's you. Right. Maybe you're the problem. You know, uh, Lord, is it I? You know, <clears throat> and uh, it goes on in verse twenty-three and says. And he answered and said, he, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. So again, is Jesus trying to, to not show them who it is? Is he trying to be vague about it? No. He's yeah. saying, look, I'm going to dip my hand in the dish, and I'm, you know, and we're going to go to John 13, if you kept something in John. Again, keep something in John tonight. We're going to be going back. And he makes it very obvious who it is. Look here in John chapter 13. John 13, I'll begin reading in verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in the spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one another, doubting of whom he spake. <clears throat> now there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his, uh, his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned him that he would, uh, that he would ask, uh, uh, ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered and said, He it is whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. So he's like, oh, you want to know who it is? I mean... He could have just, I mean, it's, he's almost to the point of just writing a note. Right. It's Judas. <laughs> and like handing it to him. And he said, because it goes on and says there, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. He says, look, you want to know who it is? I'm, it's to whom I give the sop. It's that guy. Yeah. Uh -huh. But what happens? And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said unto him, that thou doest, do it quickly. No man at the table knew, uh, knew for what intent he spake unto him. For some of them thought, because Jesus, Judas had the bag, that Jesus had sent unto him, buy those things which, uh, uh, that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He that having received the sop went out immediately, and it was night. So get the picture. They say, oh, you want to know who it is? He dips the sop, he gives it to Judas, and he says, that without do us, do us quickly. Judas gets up and leaves the room. And they all think, oh, he's probably going to buy something for the poor. Wow. <laughs> or maybe Jesus needed, forgot something that we needed. And then he's like trying to answer the question for him. But they, it's just how blinded they were to it now, and why is that? You know, I don't know. I fully, I can't fully understand why they were so blind to that fact. Maybe it was God allowed that to happen to, for so that Scripture could be fulfilled, yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it shows us that Judas's are very crafty. They're very subtle. They can sneak in so craftily and be so subtle that even those immediately around them won't even suspect them. It goes on in verse 24. It says, "The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him." But woe unto him by that man. We're back in uh, Matthew, by the way. Matthew, uh, and it says, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man uh, by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for, it, it, uh, for that man if he had not been born. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how bad it was for Judas. Yep. And there was, there's a special place in hell for that yep, guy. Right, right. You know, and uh, it, Jesus is saying, You know what? It would be better if you hadn't been born. All right. And then it says here in verse 25, Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. I mean, could Jesus be any clearer who he is? <laughs> we keep reading about it. He's giving them the sop. Judas, Judas is getting up and going out. He's saying, you know, yeah, Thou hast said. He's trying to make He's just saying, It's Judas. You know, he might as well fire a flare gun that had a big... <laughs> said it says, It's Judas. You know, with the, or get the red flashing lights. Aunt, Aunt Judas, you know. They just weren't going to get it. <clears throat> and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is said for the many, uh, for the many, for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, of course, when we read through this, we have, you can't just read over this because there's a, a religion in the world today that claims, you know, one seventh of the world's population, called the Roman Catholic Church, that thinks that they literally have to drink the blood of Jesus. Right. And, it, and let me just say right now, what Jesus just gave them to drink was not literally his blood. Uh, and, and you know, but Amen. that's what Catholics would have us to believe. Not necessarily that that was his blood there, but that now we have to drink the blood in, uh, of Christ. And what they believe is the the, the false doctrine of transubstantiation. You know, I, I was really hoping when I put that in the sermon that I would be able to type that without a spelling error, but it, I didn't, I failed. So it's a long word, right? Transubstantiation. What is that? It's basically the belief 
that when they consume uh, the, 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 the wine and the wafer at, at communion, that after they eat that, it literally becomes yeah. the blood and body of Christ in their stomach. Yeah. Literally. It's not figurative. They literally believe that when you eat that, by some miracle, it just changes in your stomach and you've consumed the very body and flesh of Christ. <laughs> it, and you say, that's an odd doctrine. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a very odd doctrine. Um. Well, you say, well, where do they get such a doctrine? Okay, well, be before I go to John 6, let me just point out there where he says, this is my blood, right? And then he said, of this fruit of the vine. Right. So we know when he's giving them the cup, it's, it's not really his blood. Right. He's saying the fruit of the vine. You know, It's a picture of his blood. Okay, yeah. But go to John chapter 6 and we'll see where they get this. And where they get this, you know, I mean, really, I heard somebody saying, I can't say I really disagree with it, is that not cannibalism? Yeah. Yep. You know, <laughs> if it's turning into flesh, human flesh in your stomach. Right. You know, it's a very strange thing indeed. But look here in chapter uh, John chapter 6, verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Uh, <clears throat> look at verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. He goes on and says, which is I give, but will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. So you can see if you were just to isolate those few verses, you could say, boy, Jesus is telling people to eat his flesh and drink his blood. But again, context is everything. Who is he talking to? The unsaved Pharisees, the Jews, who are striving among themselves, who are resisting Christ, who are not believing on him. And the Bible says that he would open his mouth in dark sayings so that they could not understand. Amen. And so, you know, this is not where you want to base, get your doctrine from. When Jesus is trying to confound his enemies and give them some dark and mysterious saying, say, well, that sounds like a good place to, to, to form, you know, uh, canon from and you know, have, have our church doctrine. And he goes on and explains it down to it when he gets alone with his disciples. <clears throat> he gets down to verse 63. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. Amen. He's saying, so if the, if the flesh is what's supposed to save us, why is he then saying the flesh profiteth nothing? Right. Right. He's saying it's the words that I speak to you. So again, that's another whole other sermon that we could really preach on this false doctrine of trans, uh, substantiation. But uh, <clears throat> well, we don't have time for that. So let's move along because we do have a lot to get to. Look there back in Matthew in verse 30. Matthew, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 30. Where the Bible reads, And when they had sung in him, they went out of the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended of me because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. Likewise said also said all the disciples. You know, and of course we know how the story goes. They end up all denying him. You know, and Peter vehemently denies him towards the end here. And really what we should learn from that is that the Bible tells us in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be few. You know, when, when if they, they understood who Jesus was, that he was the Christ, and when God is telling you this is the way it is, that's the way it's going to be. Uh -huh. And it doesn't matter all the vows you make, and in fact the Bible tells us not to just swear not at all by the, you know, uh, by the earth, where it's God's footstool. You know, that we should not make these vows like this, because they often get broken. And there are often things we can't keep. And they're often coming from a place that isn't sincere. I mean, I believe Peter, when he said that, he thought he really meant it. But Peter didn't understand the circumstances that were coming his way. Peter couldn't foresee what was about to take place. You know, Peter couldn't even understand when Jesus was telling him, I'm going to be crucified. You know, Peter probably was holding out in his mind that, you know, he's going to set up the kingdom. You know, this is it. We're going we're gonna to rule and reign right now. He couldn't understand everything that was going about to take place. 
And you know, that's the way it should be in our own lives. You know, sometimes we can't understand everything, but if it seems like God has, has told us something, you know, from his word, we read the Bible and the and Bible says, you know, thus saith the Lord, you know, we should just take it for what it says and say, thus saith the Lord. Amen. And, and accept it. And not try to make some vow or, or, or anything like that. Right. <clears throat> Especially when it's contrary to the word of God, going against the very things that, that God is telling us. You know, it goes on there in verse 36 and says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and uh, saith unto his disciples, See, here will I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and his two son, the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here, watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh, and you know, again, this is such a powerful scene in Scripture. Yeah. You know, and I preached a little while ago about the, the death of Christ. And, and this, this is part of it, you know, the, 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 the anguish, the, the mental anguish that Christ suffered you know, prior to his, his death. Um, you know, and I really, it's not something I don't have time to go into again tonight, but, you know, I don't want to just gloss over that and say, oh yeah, this is where he prayed. This is, this is a real heavy scene, of course. Yeah. And he cometh with disciples and findeth them asleep, we're in verse 40 there, and, and he saith unto Peter, what, can you not wash with me one hour? I mean, the guy who just vehemently swore only a few hours before, I will never forsake thee, is fast asleep. Oh. <laughs> you know, and he goes on and tells us why in verse 41. Watch and pray ye, they entered not in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, and that's something we all have to come to terms with, you know, as we're still in this flesh. You know, we have these great, grandiose ideas sometimes of what we're going to do for God and how we want to just, you know, and it's great to have those kind of ideas and have those lofty goals and, 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 but we have to always understand that we are battling uh, the old man. That we will always have this sinful flesh, you know, that sometimes just wants to curl up and, and forget about everything it had sworn a little, or a little bit earlier and just take a little bit of rest. And really what Jesus is telling you in verse 41, he's trying to remind Peter of that vow of loyalty that he had just given him. You know, he said, I will never forsake thee. He's saying, hey, watch and pray. You entered not in temptation. You know, Peter, you just got done telling me how you were never going to forsake me. But I can see that your flesh is getting weak and you need to watch out. And that's really what we have to do. We need to watch and pray that we don't enter into temptation. You know, we say, I'm going to, you know, we read something from the Word of God and we say, yeah, that's what God, God tells me. I had to live my life this way. I'm going to do that, you know, and we, and, we, and we make a vow in our hearts and we determine in ourselves that I'm going to obey the commandments of God. You better watch out because if you don't watch, if you don't pray, the flesh is weak and it will creep up on you when you least expect it. And uh, he says here in verse 42, it goes on and he says, He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand uh, that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave, uh, gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And again, it just reminds me that these false prophets, these Judases, they, with feigned words, the Bible right. says, right. shall deceive the hearts of the simple. Mm -hmm. They're fair speeches, as it said in Romans 16. Mm -hmm. He calls them Master, but he's not his Master. Mm -hmm. You know, they know the right things to say. They like to know how to sound spiritual. This is another one of these traits of these Judases. Is they'll 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 say all the things that sound good, but in their heart is is you know it, it's just wickedness. It goes on in verse fifty. It says, and Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? And they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. <clears throat> and then Jesus said unto him, Put up thy sword again into thy place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Now I remember the first time I ever read that. And that is one of the most powerful truths that we'll ever understand from Scripture, is that Christ willingly went to the cross. Yeah. Right. In fact, you know, we, we say he was murdered, and truly he was. 
but he allowed all these things to happen. Right. He allowed these type of these things to take place. I mean, he said right there, I can call 10,000 legions, he could have legions them, his father would give them them. Oh. <laughs> and he could have stopped everything right there. And, 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 and he didn't. And he decided to go through it. That's a very powerful truth. Amen. And then it goes on in verse 40, 54, but then how, how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it thus must be? Thus it must be. So again, you know, Jesus was not taken against his will. And I, and I think, you know, when I, when I got saved, that's really when I got saved, that was when I truly understood that for the first time. And I always understood who Jesus was and what he did. But I always had it in my mind that, you know, uh, they, didn't like, they didn't like some of the things he said and, and he, they, they crucified him. But when I got saved, it was when I realized that Jesus Christ willingly allowed these things to take place and then he did that for me. Amen. And then he did that for all of us. Uh, if you're still there in John, look over to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. John 18, I'll read to you from John 19. And he went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Of course, this is Pilate. But Jesus an, uh, and gave him no answer. Then Pilate said unto, uh, then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. You know, Jesus, these things happen because Jesus allowed them to happen, because he submitted to the Father's will and allowed these things to take place. Yeah, right. Look there in John chapter 18, verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing that all things should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed them, uh, stood with them. As soon as, they, uh, had, as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. <laughs> I mean, that, every time I read that, I get chills. Yeah. about how he could just say those words and they all fall down to the ground on their backs. Yeah. Notice they fell backwards. They didn't fall on their face in worship. They fell on their back wow. like they had been slain by, by their enemy. And I mean, that's the power that he had. He could have called the angels. He could have just spoken those words yeah. and ended everything at right. any moment. Right. You know, like that song it goes, you know, he could have come down. He, he, he could have come down. 10,000 angels stood all around, but he stayed on that cross. And he died there. I can't remember exactly. It was for you and for me. Yeah. And said, so, you know, a great song, a great truth out of the Word of God that that uh, that Jesus willingly allowed these things to take place. And we forget sometimes just how powerful Christ was, even as he walked this earth, right. yeah. and the power that he had, and how often he probably restrained himself, you know, for the sake of, of others. Yeah. And we got to move along here, of course. If you would go back to Matthew chapter 26 and verse uh, 55, it says. In Matthew 26, verse 55, In the same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out against as a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you in the t uh, teaching the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they laid hold on Jesus uh, and led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. So again, all those guys that had made that great vow, well, you know, we'll die with thee. They all flee. And it goes on in verse 58. But Peter followed him afar off from the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now when the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. At the last came two false witnesses. And they said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which, uh, what is it which uh, these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tellest us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto them, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in great clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy, what further need have we of witness? And behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. So why is it that he, at that one statement, they're ready to just, that's it, that's all they, they don't need to hear anymore. When he says, you know, you shall see the Son of Man. They said, we adjure thee, tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, thou hast said, and thou shalt see the Son of Man coming uh, with uh, uh, the right hand, uh, sitting in the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And at that instant, they're just, they're ready. That's it, they don't need to hear. They have no further need of witness. He's worthy of death, right? That's what they need. Well, that's because they understood what Jesus meant when he said that. 
They already had an understanding of what Jesus meant when he said, I am the Son of Man. Because a lot of people will say, well, Jesus never said he was God. And Jesus never one time said, I am God. But he refers to himself as a, as a, as a, as a role that the Jews at that time clearly understood. That when he said, I am the Son of, the Son of Man, I am uh, the Christ, the Son of God. They knew that that meant that he is God. They understood that. And we really don't have time to go into it, but if you go into, if you look at Daniel, I'll read to you from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. It said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, like, one like the Son of Man came in the clouds of heaven. The Jews had these scriptures. Yeah. They read this. They understood this. They say, oh, the Son of Man uh, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancients of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His <laughs> Him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and which shall not pass away in his kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. Amen. So when he says, "I am," you shall see the Son of Man coming with the right hand, of, uh, sitting in the right hand of power, and and so on and so forth, uh, coming in the clouds of heaven. They, under, I believe, they understood that's what he was referring to, yeah. and they were referring. He was referring to the fact that yes, I am God, and that was the blasphemy which he spake, <clears throat> that he was claiming to be God. So to say, well, maybe he never said those exact words, I am God. You know, uh, but he did say, he referred to himself by a title that was a, a divine title, a title of deity, that the Jews at that time understood. <clears throat> and really, that, that's another doctrine that, uh, you know, we could even go into the fact that Jesus has always been the Son of God. Amen. You know, yeah. because they understood, you know, when they, like when he asked Peter, who sayest thou uh, that I am? You know, but who say ye that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? That was a title they were already familiar with, and they knew what it meant. And um, why were they familiar with that title? Because that's a title that's been around a long time, because Christ has always been the Son of God. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but again, that's another another doc, another sermon we have to preach at another time. And uh, look there at verse 66. We'll move ahead here for the sake of time. In verse 66, he said, What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then they did spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? I mean, that is some bold, yeah. that, that, that right there. I mean, can you imagine yeah. what was taking place there? That, that, that fool had no idea who yeah. he was hitting. Right. <laughs> and and uh, that, that, again, just, and you read these things, and you, you realize what, what Christ actually went through, right. what really happened to him. It's, it's, it's graphic. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really just telling of God's love towards us. Now Peter uh, sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not the man. And after a while, uh, uh, after a while came unto him them that, they that stood by and said to Peter, uh, Surely thou also art one of them. Thy speech berateth thee. For saying, he's, so here again, he's turning to the same guy and saying, I will never deny thee. I will never forsake thee. You know, first he scatters, right, when the others scatter. And now he's being interrogated by a, a, a maid, by a girl. You know, and he's denying. I mean, he's got, you know, and, and why is that? You could say, well, he's being a coward. And you know what? I wouldn't disagree with that. You know, he's afraid of the testimony of Christ at this point. You know, he's, he's afraid of what might happen to him. You know, if he's identified as one of the disciples, maybe he'll be taken. You know, we could fault Peter and beat him up for that, but, you know, have we ever been in that position? Right. Have we ever been in the place where, you know, claiming the name of Christ might cost us our necks? You know, so it's easy to just pass judgment on Peter when we read these scriptures, but, you know, Peter really in the scriptures shows us the human element there that we all have, that we all have this possibility that it could be us one day saying, I know not the man. Right. You know, the boss at work says, you know, what church do we go to? You know, are you, is Pastor Anderson your pastor? Uh, I know not the man. <laughs> <laughs> Just deny it. Because um, you don't want to be associated with the, you know, right. the beliefs that, that are preached from across, across the pulpit. So, you know, we all have that in us. You know, we, we have to be on guard about these things. And right. make sure that we're, you know, resolute and, and, and following through and, and not being afraid to identify with Christ. Right. And in verse 70, but he denied before them all, saying, I know not thou what thou sayest. And he would have gone out of the porch, so he's trying to get away. You know, he's trying to distance himself for these people, like, oh, I know not the man, you know. I know not what thou sayest, and get away, right. you know. And he said, and he, and he uh, in verse 72, and he denied again with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while they came unto him that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech berateth thee. 
So they identified him, you know, by his accent, by the way he talked, you know. Uh, they, they, they said, no, we, we know it's you. You can't deny it. You know, <clears throat> we, we've seen your Facebook page. You know, we went, we went and looked at your YouTube channel. Right. We saw what you were liking on YouTube. Right. <laughs> we know you're, you're associated with that faithful Word Baptist Church. <clears throat> and he goes, and he began, but what does he do? Oh, you got me. Yeah. You know, when it, when it should be obvious that, you know, that the gig is up and he can't just continue to deny it. But what does he do? He doubles down. Then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock grew. <clears throat> and Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which, uh, he, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. I mean, that's probably the lowest point of Peter's life right there. I mean, the, the, the realization, if you would turn over to Luke chapter 22, and we'll wrap it up here, to Luke chapter 22. Because there's another element. I mean, what was it that, that brought, it wasn't just, you know, the sound of the rooster crowing and the cock crowing. It wasn't just him remembering the words. There was actually something else that took place in this moment. And if you look at Luke chapter 22, verse 60, and Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he spake, we're in verse 60, the cock crew. Look at Luke, verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered. So that was the other thing that took place. It wasn't just him hearing the cock crow. It wasn't just him remembering the words. It was the fact that he, after he had said those very words, he looked Christ right in the face and saw him looking right back. Uh -huh. And I believe that's really what broke his heart. Yeah. Because yeah. he realized, you know, that God knew what yeah. he did. You know, you know, Peter gets a bad rap and, and, and you know, and in some ways, you know, he kind of earned it. We can't be, but you know what? He ended it well, didn't he? Right. Yeah. He went out and wept bitterly. He did the right thing. Right. At least he wasn't just like, well, you know, you got me. I guess I'll just go back to fishing and you'll never hear from me again. Right. It broke his heart, you know, right. and really that's the same attitude we should have because, I, you know, none of us is perfect. And I guarantee you, you know, it's real easy to act tough in our sin, isn't it? We think we're getting away with it and we can just act tough like nobody sees, nobody knows what I'm up to, I'm getting away with it. But when you realize who's really watching, when you realize one day that God has seen it all, that God knows what's going on in your heart, God knows what's going on in your mind, you know, that's when you're, that's when you're going to break. And hopefully you have that same reaction. You know, that's what breaks your heart. Not that, you know, uh, somebody might find out what you're up to or, you know, it might cost you something in your life. I mean, those things should definitely be deterrents for us to not live a life of sin. But when we really understand and realize that God is watching us and it's the same God who, you know, went through all those things that he went through in the garden, being buffeted, you know, have, being mocked and ridiculed. It's that same God that turned and looked to Peter. That's the same one that's watching us. And if he catches us denying him, not living for him, living a life of sin, I hope that we all have that same reaction that, that Peter has. And really we can commend Peter for that. I mean, all the other things we can beat him up for and say, oh, Peter this, Peter that. And probably in a lot of ways, if we were being honest, we've probably all been guilty in some way, to some degree, of those same things. But can we say we all have the same reaction that Peter had when he got busted? That he went out and wept bitterly? You know, and praise God for that. The Bible says, Whosoever confesseth the forsaken the sin shall have mercy. Amen. You know, if we confess our sin, uh, uh, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And we know later in the story, you know, Jesus comes to Peter and asks him three times, you know, you know lovest thou me, Lord thou knowest. And Peter comes to realization, God knows everything. You know, I don't have to sit here and, and just spout off about how I'm never going to deny thee. You know, because you already know that I'm going, you know, what's in my heart, and you already know that I love you. So if we have a genuine, sincere love, you know, if we love God, if any man love God, the same is known of him. But, uh, you know, if we love God, when God catches us in our sin, when we come to our, our senses and realize what we've been doing or what we're up to and how it's hurt God, hopefully we'll have that same reaction where we, we weep and we get it right and we do what Peter did, go on and do great works for God. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> that's going to do it for the sermon tonight. Let's go ahead and pray.